You're listening to the best local sports show. Boots, Bats and Balls on Six Towns Radio. Hello and welcome to another edition of Pottering About, the series which sees me catch up with a player that has a connection to Stoke City and their opponents, which this weekend are Southampton. My guest today sadly departed Stoke City this summer after almost seven years at the club, changing the dynamics of the entire team in the process and scaring Premier League defences for fun, week in, week out. Known for his exemplary attitude and superb charity work, he's probably even better known as a man with a mammoth throw in. He is, of course, Burton Albion's Rory Delap. So, Rory, welcome to the show. Hi, Ross. How are you, mate? I'm okay, thank you. So, let's start actually by talking about Burton Albion because you joined them this summer. And considering they're a League Two side, there's a bit of a step down for you. So, what made you choose Burton over other clubs? Because I know you spent a few months with Gary Rowett at Derby. Was he a major factor in choosing Burton? Yeah, he was obviously knowing him and knowing him enough. I played with him at Derby for for sort of eighteen months, and then we've lived in the same village as him now for sort of five or six years, and seen him sort of knocking about here and there. It was, you know, there was there was a few offers around, but you know, nothing concrete, and uh, he just invited us down to to have a couple of days down there and see see what we kind of thought of each other, and um, I was impressed with it and. Uh, you know, as I say, I wanted I wanted to go to a club that was was going to look at, at you know hopefully getting a promotion or, or you know being up that end of the table rather than sort of finishing mid table or, or or fighting near the bottom. So um, you know the the they nearly got there last year, and as I say, they had a they had a good squad and they've added a few to that. Um, hopefully we can we can get promoted this year. So can you tell us which clubs did approach you? Well, I. I, I just, you know, one of my best mates is Tommy Agent, and I tell him that I don't know any, anything until someone actually puts an offer on the table. And, yeah. Um, you know, because you don't want to uh, sort of be feeling bad or good or whatever when you when you come against these. You know, I've, I've done it all my career, and, uh, you know, he said every, everything was coming in, I'd, I'd either have to commute or, or move. You know, he said there was nothing, nothing really within sort of two, two hours, so... Uh, I presume that was either way down south or or, or, or up north. So uh, it was, you know, that was that was another part of the thing that, you know, it's, it's only 15 minutes from where I live. And speaking about the gaffer just before, Gary Rower, he's one of the youngest managers in the Football League at 39. So he's only a couple of years older than yourself. But you've been on the UEFA B coaching badge course as well lately. Do you plan yeah. to emulate Gary and go into management when you eventually call it a day? Or would you prefer to be part of maybe the backroom staff, like a coach, or part of the youth academy set up at a club? Certainly, at this stage, the, the management doesn't interest me at all, really. Um, but I've done a, a bit of coaching, and enjoy that. I've done quite a bit with kids, and then quite a bit sort of with academy lads, and I've enjoyed that. You know, there's there's a lot of people out there now with badges looking for jobs. And, you know, you know, there's, there's there's so many coaches looking looking at f- for certain jobs and it seems to be, you know, if someone you know or something you've worked with or played with or something before and that seems to be the way in for a lot of people and, and everyone who's, you know, who I've played with is either coaching or managing have got into the game through um, th- that sort of angle. So um, it's it's something I'll, I'll, I'll look at once I finish but, you know, just for the time being I'll, I'll just get my qualifications done and say wait, wait until, I, until I finish. So, is there a time scale in your mind of when that will be, or do you think that when it comes to that time, you just think, right, now it's time to to start playing? Uh, well, at the moment, because I've, I've been injured and I've got a bit of a niggy hamstring. I had it a little bit when I was on loan at Barnes last year, and I've got it again this year. So, you know, and if you'd asked me sort of seven, eight games into the season, I'd, I'd have said I'd, I'd like to give it another year, but you know, it's, it's just frustrating being injured again and. You know, hopefully I can get back fit and play, play you know a good part, and if I can get back so sort of end of you know middle to end of this month, yeah. get back playing the mic. But at this moment, I'll, I'll probably be it for at the end of this year, to be honest. So I talk, let, let's talk about your time at Stoke, actually, because when I told people that I was interviewing you this week, I had a lot of people talk to me and tell me, tell you how much you missed at Stoke. So here's, here's a few things that I got from. People. I got right. I got does Rory miss us because I miss Rory and then I had <laughs> let him know that we love him dearly and then finally I had tell him that I say hello because I love him 
does it make you proud <laughs> to see so much love from Stoke fans? And like the first person said, do you miss Stoke? Is, are they all off Ryan, are they? <laughs> no, they're not all off Ryan, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, of, course, of course you miss the place. Um, you know, you miss going in and seeing sort of familiar faces every day. And, you know, you, obviously for, for games and training, you got to know quite quite a few of the fans, you know, pretty well. You know, I've, I've I've seen a few who've came to Burton games, and I've seen them outside and things as well. You know, which is, which is great, and it means means a lot to me. But um, yeah, of course, you miss it. But football is one of those sort of funny funny games that you, you know you when you move on, you've just got to sort of get on with it. And you know, you, as you say, you play for play for another team. But you know, still will always. Uh, you know, as I say, I've said before, it's you know probably the best period of, of um, in my career you know that'll, that'll live with me forever Was it out of your hands whether or not you'd be staying at the club or did the change in management alter what was happening with your own contract? No, not at all you know I, 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 I didn't play um, at all last season really and um, you know I'd, I'd spoke to spoke to the gaffer and you know sort of it well it was, it was a bit too late really for me to do anything at the end of the summer transfer window last year, when he, you know, when he signed a few, uh, quite a few midfielders on, on sort of around line day, and I knew then that I, I wouldn't be involved. But I went to see him and told him that, you know, I, I, I still wanted to play and wanted to get out, and you know, he, you know, he said, you know, I'd like to keep me around the place, but sort of that six months was was really hard because, you know, I was. I was travelling to games and going to the home games and things and knowing that I wasn't even going to make the bench and, and things like that. And, you know, it was hard to keep positive. You know, you try and keep positive and have a have an effect still on, on the lads, you know, even though even though you're not involved. But, you know, I'd sort of by sort of the end of September, October, um, you know, I'd, I'd sort of made my mind up. I only had the year left and there was, there was no fooling around that, you know... It would be worthwhile to the club or myself, you know, uh, to to sign another year, even even then. But uh, you know, I had a great run, and it just it's just an age thing that unfortunately happens to to all of us, you know. But it was it, you know it was great of, of, of the club for for what they'd done to me, and then to to help me get out on loan to Barnsley. And obviously, you just mentioned Tony Pulis because. Then two two games of your Stoke career on loan, you suffered a broken leg, and Tony Pulis and Peter Coates stuck by their word of a permanent deal, and gave you a permanent deal in January, I think it was. So, what yeah. was your relationship like with Tony and Peter last year at Stoke? Were you surprised to see him leave this summer? Um, I, I kind of wasn't. I wasn't obviously, you know, the um, up until up until Christmas, they were, they were flying, and then whatever reason it was. Sort of from Christmas onwards, uh, you know, the, the work and the results, and you know, although the, the play wasn't wasn't great at times, and you know, people sort of were, were critical all all the way through, um, been at Stoke, but you know, we were getting the results, and you know, people are happy when you when you get results, but um, for whatever reason, they couldn't buy a win at that that time after Christmas, and uh, I think, you know, I think both the manager, the team. Sort of the fans even, um, you know, sort of could sense something was going to happen, and you know, I think everyone was a little bit surprised that it it sort of happened so quickly after the season. I think people kind of thought, well, you know, there might be a, a coach coming or um, something like that. But um, to you know, to to sort of go on, you can understand the gaffer's gaffer's point of view that. He wasn't gonna gonna change too much, you know. He tried a little bit the players he signed, you know. It was it was probably best in all interests that, and um, you know, the party because you know you don't you don't want to do, go into another season have a bad one, and then spoil spoil the good work he'd done in in the previous years. And I just mentioned as well your injury, the broken leg, and I'd like to hear your view on something regarding another long term injury because. You're somebody who probably knows Ryan Shawcross best than most, and for the past few years, he's been plagued by a lot of negative and often hurtful press after the Aaron Ramsey incident. So, as somebody who's been on the receiving end of a long-term injury, can you sympathise with both parties in a way? Um, 
<laughs> not really, no. <laughs> no. Um, no, I, I think you know some of the some of the stuff Ryan's had to to put up with is is terrible. You know, you know it was a, it was a, it was a horrendous injury. Um, you know, I was I was I was in the same boat as him. Um, you know myself, and you know, sort of some people were, were questioning whether it was Robbie Elliott who did mine, whether he'd meant it or whether he'd gone in too strongly or whether he. And and I, I, I was I was of the opinion that I wasn't bothered either way really. You know, I knew Robbie, and you know when I was at Sunderland, I, I got on with him. And you know, he, he he was a tough player, but stuff stuff like that happens in football all the time, and you know, in, in the park, on on a pitch, you know, in in cup finals, you know, everywhere, every level it happens, and um, it, unfortunately, it's part of the game that you're going to get injured at some stage, and. You know the, the you know the stuff Ryan's had to go through just shows how, how strong he is, and you know we, we we all felt for for Aaron at the time, but you know as, as I say, no, I I don't know of anyone that would go into a tackle to intentionally put someone out for a long time, and that was that was my case. In my case, I spoke to Robbie the day after I'd done it, you know, and he sent he sent me up some book, he sent me some Lance Armstrong books, which. You know, to, to sort of while away the time, and you know, spoke to him a couple of times after that, and I had no hard feelings towards him. And you know, I, I, I just think, obviously, you know, some of the some of the things that happened that happened to Ryan are, are disgusting, really. And uh, you know, it should, it should have been put to bed a long time ago. And we we can't talk to you Rory without mentioning the long throw because it was an incredible weapon at Stoke, especially most prominently in the Premier League. Um, I think Macaulay gets six down to Rob Ledger. Probably helped the hype a little bit with his long throw T-shirts and mugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in truth, without the throw, I'd, I'd probably say Stoke would have been relegated in the first season. So, did you ever think it would be so effective in the Premier League? I, I don't know. I don't know if they would have been relegated. I don't know if it was that. Uh, <laughs> it was. It was. It, it, it was that much to play. And, you know, we got off, we got a few goals out of it. No, but we. Uh, I, I, I just think at, at, at that time. You know, and we got a couple of important goals from them, and yeah, it was more of the people were playing it up more than more than us, and uh, as a team, and um, you know, as I say, I, th- I think I think it helped us going into games because you know people thought that's all all we were about, so we knew different, but you could tell teams teams didn't want to want to be there because they, they knew what was going to happen with obviously the throws and. And free kicks and corners and, and the size of the lads in the team at that stage were, you know, was was probably pretty frightening for some teams. I was actually talking to an old teammate of yours at Stoke, Dominic Matteo, a couple of months ago, and we got talking about pain killing injections like cortisone and stuff. And yeah. he was telling me about his uh, foot injury and how, in the long run, the injections have had a massive impact on his body. He's even had to have an operation on his back. Is that something yeah. that's ever worried you when you've been taking them? Because I think you had some for your shoulders, didn't you? I think most lads have had had something, and you know, at some stage, and obviously, it's it's not good for you. But at at, at that time, you know, you're sort of given a choice, and um, by you know, the doc or something, and you know, they're saying, look, we're advising you probably not to play. As I say, you know, ninety ninety five percent of lads I've known and played with. Um, you know, we'll play through pretty much anything that can get away with. You know, I, yeah, you sort of you sort of take things, and as Dom says, you probably take them, have them, yeah, and, and probably do suffer suffer later on. But you don't you don't think about that at the time. And if if you sometimes have a, a jab or play with a little injury sometimes, and and you win the game, it, it, it kind of makes it worthwhile. And but um, you know, if you if you don't have a bit of a stinker and lose the game, then you go the other way. But uh, that, that's the risk you take sometimes. But uh, it's it's one of those things that's been around for for years and years in football. And you know, I, I can remember when I first started out. You know, the old the old players would have to have them to put they couldn't play without them. And you know, they'd have one before the game and one at half time. And so they're advised by the medical staff not to. But um, you know, if a player player forces it on on someone and said, look, I'm, 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 I'm playing with or without the injection. Um, you know, it, it happens and, you know, probably in 15, 20 years' time, it, it might not not be the case. You know, you might not be allowed them. 
Um, but I'm sure there's, there's there's loads of footballers week in week out, as I say, playing with injuries and and, and having having these jabs. Uh, we'll talk about your um, time at Southampton now because you moved there from Derby for a club record, well, a then club record fee of four million pounds, which saw you reach an FA Cup final. Well, you reached an FA, FA Cup final and qualify for Europe. Unfortunately, didn't make the final. But it was a special few years for Saints when you were there, wasn't it? It, it was, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we had a, um, a, a great, a great sort of four years there. Um, you know, as, as you say, getting getting to the cup final. Unfortunately, um, I, I ruptured my ankle, and um, sort of two or three weeks before the final and missed it. Um, but again, you know, getting getting into Europe, um, it was it was slightly different back then because it was. Uh, it was just pure knockout stages, and, and we got knocked out in the first game against Stel Bucharest. But um, you know, to actually play in Europe and be involved, um, as, as all Stoke fans will know from a couple of years ago, it yeah. was fantastic. But you know, the that four good years we had there, the, the last the last year I was there was um, probably probably one of the worst I've had as, as a footballer. So Strachan and left, and Sturrock came in and. Was, things were sort of looking pretty good under him, and then two games into the season, the, the chairman sacked him and, and decided to uh, try and try and revolutionise football. And, and then the next year, we had I think we had five five or six managers and got relegated. And that was that. I've actually been talking to a Southampton fan as well when I told him I was interviewing you, and he's asked me to ask you a couple of questions. And firstly. He wants to know why the the long throw wasn't utilised as much at Saints because what I've always wondered is was it something that Tony Pulis highlighted or was it just that it, were, it you weren't aware of how effective it was in your early stages of your career? Uh, no, because I, I, I said before that I've used it at every club I've been at, but yeah. at Carlisle, you know, we had we had two lads um, and myself that were were over six foot, so if you're you know throwing. <laughs> 30 balls in a game, you're not going to win a header. No. Um, and then again, when when I moved to Derby, we, we did it slightly different. Where he'd want want me taking the long throws from sort of just inside our half, and he'd try and suck everyone to the ball, and then get one of the you know we had a couple of fast forwards, and then them days, you know, and I had to throw it over the heads of the the back four that we were playing. So they could run onto it and be on and go. And then we used it a bit at Southampton, but it was like one just track, and I only ever used it if you know we were we were losing or drawing the game in the last sort of two or three minutes if we got a throw in in the final third, and it was never. But again, you know we we only had sort of two or three players over six foot, but sort of you know going going to Stoke, you know you you suddenly in a team where. You know, you've gone from being one of the tallest in the side to the smallest in the side, <laughs> and you know, I, I always say that that made a hell of a difference. I said, but you know, we had we had brave lads at the time that had throw the head at anything, and that helps as well. And he also wants to know about a special goal that he scored for Southampton, the bicycle kick. It was it against Spurs, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I, cause I remember this goal, and it was a bit of a screamer. Um, he wants to know, was that the best goal you've ever scored? And did you teach that technique to Peter Crouch? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's definitely the best best ever scored, and uh, um, yeah, probably by by uh, you know I've scored some good goals to be honest, but um, that's that's by far the best. I, I don't think Crouch needs got anything to do with volley, and he's, he's he's probably one of the best volleys I've I've seen in the game. So, <laughs> <laughs> not taking that one. Um, no. <laughs> ho- hopefully this won't be too awkward for you, Rory, and I don't want you sitting on the fence here either. But I do want a prediction ahead of the game, please. So Stoke versus Southampton at the Brit. What's the score going to be? Uh, I'm going for a classic nil nil. Uh, <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah, I think uh, I think Stoke need to win more than Southampton at the moment. So I'll put them down for the two centre half scoring two nil. Two now. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. And yeah. finally, Rory, I just wondered, have you got a message for the Stoke fans that are listening? Yeah, just you know, I'd just like to thank them for you know for everything they did for me while I was there. You know, I had a lot of support and and letters and and things for the club when I broke my leg and you know I'd only played one one and a little bit of a game for the club at the time and 
you know, hopefully, hopefully, I went, went some way to repay that. But you know, I've, I've nothing but praise. You know, I've not got one one bad word to say about anyone at, at Stoke, which is, um, you know, pretty pretty rare for a player to to say that. You know, there's never been a problem. You know, that that goes to show how how good the fans they are. Thanks so much for joining us today, Rory. Best luck for the rest of the season. Hope the hamstring clears up. Speak to you again soon, mate. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Cheers, man. Cheers, Rory.